I'm going to, to be short because we are running out of time and I would like to give as much time as possible to Christina. So Christina is an expert on migration and she has worked on different uh, issues, uh, skilled migration and innovation. Uh, she has a, a couple of papers on uh, climate change and migration. Uh, one uh, very important paper with Giovanni uh, in the GIA where they show that uh, the response to increasing temperature depends on initial income. And uh, quite recently, she has also worked on the interaction between uh, climate change, conflict, and migration. So today, she's going to present a paper with uh, Emanuele, Shuro, and Fabio. And uh, if uh, I'm not mistaken, it's going to be about projections of uh, human mobility uh, with respect to future uh, climate change. So, uh, Christina, it's up to you. And thank you very much to, to be with us. And we are very happy to have you on board. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for the nice introduction and uh, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me to present. This is the first time I, I present this paper and I really would love to get some feedbacks from you who are very, you know, <laughs> you are experts. Okay, so as Michelle said, this is going to be a paper on uh, projections of human migration due to climate change. Okay, so why did we decide to approach such a topic? Because I think there is a lot of interest in predicting what would be the number of future migrants that move because of climatic uh, stresses. And uh, the problem is that despite the interest, there is still a lot of uncertainty concerning such estimates. Uh, typically, two different approaches have been used to kind of project uh, in the future, the numbers. One approach uh, is basically taking into consideration the number of people at risk because of uh, risk of uh, facing a climatic stress. The problem is that such numbers tend to overestimate the, the true numbers because being at risk does not necessarily mean that the person would move. Why? Because uh, there might be some uh, forms of adaptation that up to now do not exist, but might be in place in the future. Another approach uh, basically considers uh, uh, base, base end of century projections based on historical relationship. The problem, which actually this is the same approach that we apply now, but so the limitation of the existing literature is that they tend to consider very short uh, period of analysis in the historical estimate. That means that they tend to consider short-run responses to climatic stressors. And we know that short-run uh, are different from long-run responses, and uh, that could pr produce uh, bias in both directions, both underestimate and overestimate. In one case, is again because of adaptation, so we don't know, you know, a longer time Pan, whether some adaptation, alternative adaptation mechanism uh, are in place, but could also underestimate because, for example, in the short run, one household can employ some liquidity to face uh, some risks, which, of course, uh, is not available over a longer period. So that means that such approach is not sustainable in the long run. This is just to say that short run can you know, differ from, from long run responses. And finally, there is a lot of uncertainty about the future climate models on the one hand, but also socioeconomic scenarios. Okay, so what's uh, the literature so far did? In, um, more specifically, we all know there is an extensive literature on the link between uh, weather shocks uh, and uh, migration, internal and international. So now the number of papers that consider historical relationship is really big. Uh, uh, just as an example, you know, we were able to produce two different meta-analyses, one uh, from Bain, uh, from Michelle, and the other one from Hoffman. And the two meta-analyses uh, uh, collected and included something like 45 empirical papers in one and 30 in the other. But despite such a big body of knowledge on historical relationship, only five contributions try to produce projections. And these are the ones listed in the slide. But again, the majority of the papers that I quoted consider yearly, so short run variation in weather shocks. And then they try to apply the same relationship for the future. And then another, I would say not limitation, but another differences of 
this literature compared to what I will present uh, in a second, is that these projections are based on unilateral outflows rather than bilateral outflows. Now I just uh, gave a couple of examples of projections in the future. One is made by the World Bank, uh, is the famous Groundswell report that predicts that by 2050, the number of climate migrants would be, that's the upper limit, something like 143 million people. But this is only considering internal migration, so migration within the borders of the countries. And uh, there is another paper, which is from Miss Sirian and Schlenker. They apply a very similar methodology compared to the one that I will present, but they only consider asylum application. And they project, they predict that the, uh, the number of asylum applications will increase by 28% or up to 188% uh, by the end of the century, depending on the emission scenarios that they consider. But again, this is only something that consider asylum application, which is a, a completely different types of migration compared to ordinary migrants. And finally, they apply a unilateral context, meaning that they just um, analyze what are the outflows from the origin country, no matter where they go. Uh, now, what we do in this paper, uh, we basically, uh, as I anticipated, we employ a bilateral framework over a long time spell, and we use decadal data. So there are some advantages of using a bilateral compared to a unilateral framework. First, we can employ a very rich set of fixed effects. And second, uh, we can basically look at specific patterns of migration, in particular geographical patterns of, of migration. And I think this is of high interest, in particular for European countries, because we are all aware that, for example, Africa will uh, somehow be a big driver, a big source of migration, which is directed to Europe. So a big question is how many climate migrants do we expect in Europe? And we can actually give an answer applying a bilateral framework. Then our specification includes uh, average temperature, average precipitation, but we also try to add some newly developed indicators for both drought and flood, which are based on precipitation. While uh, the uh, typical indicators of uh, disasters like drought and flood are often taken from databases, drawn from insurance records or news. And we know that such uh, sources of data could have some reporting or endogeneity bias. And finally, we link migration flows to average and extreme climatic stressors, and we quantify the net partial effect of climatic stressors on bilateral migration. This is just to say that, uh, except for the fixed effects, uh, we only include climatic indicators. We don't include other controls such as GDP, quality of institutions, and other, because what we want to see is the final, the net effect of climate, no matter what is the, the channel to migration. Now, as I said, we, given that we include uh, the origin country fixed effects, uh, we use the random and exogenous decadal to decadal variation in the weather for the identification. And, uh, and once we estimate our uh, historical in-sample relationship, we combine the parameter estimates first with multimodal mean of future climate, and then we also simulate uh, the impacts applying a uniform scenario, meaning that we just uh, increase uh, warming by one, two, and three degrees uh, in a uniform way to all countries to see what would be the, uh, the, the, the expected impact. And finally, given that our dependent variable in the specification is emigration rates, which are the flows divided by the population, once we predict the rates, we then compute the flows. So basically, we are able to build the future outflow using population projections. And finally, we estimate bootstrap confident intervals using something like a thousand runs.
Now we have, of course, different. Uh, so, okay, I see. I see a question. Hi, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Hi. Since, you, since you, were, you, you were describing the, I mean, it's it's really fascinating. So I was I was just, of course, linking the approach that you're using with the shortcomings you've identified in the literature. So, of course, you rightly say that a lot of the literature is focusing on this short, relatively short-term impact, even though you we're especially for predictions, more interested in, in longer, longer run uh, predictions. So I was just wondering whether, like, given that you actually, since you say decadal to decadal changes, and you're going to go more into the details of, of your data, but I'm guessing you have many decades. So I was just thinking about whether you've, you've tried and, and, and estimate other types of models that would allow you to just have, you know, longer term lags or dynamic effects so at least investigate them since you have such a yeah amazing amount of data in a way that that might, might matter or might be relevant for of course uh, uh, informing longer term predictions which are like 20 50 years from now okay thanks for the question uh, okay as you pointed the advantage of the data that i, I will show in a second is that it's historical, it spells over a very long time span. And the time we project in the future is basically on average the same time interval that we exploit in the historical data. Okay, so what we did, it, we simply model a static relationship between contemporaneous average uh, decadal temperature, for example, and uh, the average uh, bilateral rates, uh, so immigration rates uh, during that decade. But of course, uh, and then, sorry, uh, okay, I, I will present the estimates, uh, uh, but of course I will base my projections only on one specification, which is our baseline. But then, of course, uh, one can actually uh, change a little bit that specification and also allow some, uh, uh, some lags, even if, uh, you know, uh, the dynamic normally uh, makes sense when you have... Uh, more frequent data. So if you have yearly data on flows, then it could be that, uh, you, you know, you don't know whether it's the current uh, temperature that uh, affects uh, the flows in that year. So you may want to add some lags. When you have decadal information, which is the average of what is happening on an entire 10 years interval, I do think that the use of lags is probably less uh, uh, necessary. But ne nevertheless, I think I, uh, you know, we can easily try to see whether the data support such specification. Okay, I hope I, I answered the question. Yeah. Okay, so what data do we use? As I said, we, we use different sources of data. As for migration, we consider the data set uh, compiled by Abel in 2018, which basically applying an indirect estimation model, they were able to derive flows from stock information. And I will show you that we apply robustness checks using flows computed as a delta between one decade and the other, which is also another more naive approach to derive the flows. And we also basically interact the period of analysis to 2000 in a robustness check because as you could see, Abel exploited two different data sets for stocks. One is the global bilateral migration database, which is consistent within uh, the four decades, but it also adds the United Nations Population Division stocks for 2010, which of course has been built with uh, a different uh, approaches. But anyway, the robust are quite consistent. Sorry, the results are, are very robust. As for the climatic data, we have, we use both, of course, historical information taken from the GILDAS uh, data sets. These are information on temperature and precipitation. The, this is a reanalyzed data set, which comes uh, in a gridded version uh, with a spatial resolution of one degree and a temporal resolution at uh, three hours. And starting from the gridded and hourly information, we are able to compute the various indicators by uh, aggregating uh, the cells uh, using population weights. So we move from the gridded to the country level information. 
Okay, for future, in terms of climate, we consider multimodal mean of temperature and precipitation estimates coming from five different uh, uh, global circulation models of the NASA Earth Exchange uh, Global uh, uh, Project. And these are downscaled and bias corrected uh, projections. And we will consider different emission scenarios. We need the population weights, as I said, because we need to move from cell to country level information. And we take uh, uh, population information from the gridded population of the world the data set. And finally, and this is an important part of our uh, analysis, we only exploit information on population projections. And this information comes from John O'Neill's uh, 2016, and they are derived for different shared socioeconomic pathways. Now, given that the audience is mainly of uh, uh, migration experts, I, I thought uh, I could give you some hints uh, of what are RCPs and what are the SSPs, because you will hear these terms uh, many times during uh, the presentation of my results. Okay, so the RCP is simply representative concentration pathways, and these are scenarios. Uh, they are scenarios of future carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, different scenarios have been developed depending on whether we imagine a future with low, intermediate, or high emissions. For example, the RCP 2.6 is the one that uh, imagine a world of low emissions in the future. RCP 8.5 is the one with very high emissions in the future, and 4.5 and 6.5 is a, a scenario with intermediate emissions. Now consider that the way such scenario has been developed, just consider the emissions, no matter what is the, the world surrounding it. So for example, if we want to estimate the cost of moving from one RCP to the other, one must start from a scenario that describes the economy, the energy sector, the technology that generates emissions that are consistent with the one envisaged by the specific RCP. And this is one part of the story, so emissions. On the other side, we do have the shared socioeconomic pathways, which goes from one up to five. And this is simply a kind of narrative of socioeconomic developments of the future. And uh, typically, okay, typically, as I mentioned, these are five different pathways, and we can position each of them in a graph where we consider on one axis, uh, the mitigation challenges, and on the other one, the adaptation challenges. What does it mean? So, for example, a scenario with, uh, uh, with high uh, mitigation challenges is a scenario with, um, for example, very high GDP growth, but at the same time, very high emissions. Uh, on the contrary, a scenario with high adaptation challenges is the one where growth, uh, economic growth is slow, or there is a lot of inequality in the development of the GDP. And uh, the, the reason why this uh, narrative has been developed is because they allow us to generate scenarios of key drivers, such as population, GDP growth, and emissions. Now, there are, as I say, the five different scenarios in this specific project. We will consider just three of them. The SSP1, which is the sustainability scenarios where emissions are low, economic growth is fast, and development is equitable. That means that both mitigation and adaptation challenges are low. There is uh, the SSP5 in our analysis, which is the fossil fuel development. On the contrary, such a, a scenario has very low challenges to adaptation, but uh, mitigation challenges are high. And finally, the SSP3, which is the so-called regional ribery, is a scenario where both mitigation and adaptation uh, challenges are high. Now, as I say, the SSP and RCP has been developed in independent ways from one another, but clearly they can be combined, but they should be combined in a consistent way. So just to make an example, the RCP 8.5 can only be combined with the SSP 5, because only the scenarios of SSP 5 can generate emissions that are high enough 
to match the emissions described under the S RCP 8.5. Okay, so sorry if I gave this introduction, but for me it's important that you understand the meaning and, and why we selected some scenarios and one and some uh, RCP. Okay, so going back to the migration topic, so this is the specification that we tested historically. The dependent variable are emigration rates, which are the flows from I to J in the decade beginning with ERT. Then we add the average temperature in the source country, in the origin country of the flows, again, in, you know, uh, uh, consistently with the, uh, with the decada. We have average precipitation, and then, as I said, we have an indicator for drought in the decade and an indicator for excess precipitation, for floods in the decade. And then uh, we, we add the two terms that should capture multilateral resistance that I will describe in a second. And then we add the origin country fixed effects, destination country time decade fixed effects. And depending on the specification, we have also a pair fixed effects. And we, uh, okay, so what are, you, you should probably all know what is multilateral resistance is basically a factor that captures the influence of uh, uh, alternative destinations. So the attractiveness or the barrier that alternative destinations that has not been chosen would derive. Uh, typically, this term is controlled through destination year uh, dummies, which is, something we do. As I said, uh, we add the destination decade dummies, but then we also add the two additional terms uh, in agreement with the uh, Groschel and, and Steinvax uh, 2017. Basically, we computed these are information that varies at the pair and decadal level, and it is computed by the product of the average distance between I and J, or a contiguity variable from I and J, and then is multiplied by the destination country's relative migrant potential, which is expressed through the share of the population of the destination over the world population in the specific decada. Uh, Christina, yeah. uh, uh, I am a little bit puzzled by the fact that these terms have a bilateral dimension because the, the usual way to account for multilateral resistant terms is that they are origin time specific and uh, the inward and the outward uh, resistance migration terms. So here you have the IJT dimension for both terms. Can you explain? Uh... Okay, my I, I my clearly my understanding is that uh, okay we, what we observe is that some flows from I to J, but of course, when the migrant has to choose, he had a different options, okay, ex ante. And uh, I think that something that varies at the, the so you, this, this term takes into consideration the weight or the attractiveness that all possible destinations of the world has for that specific flow. So I don't know if probably I was not clear, but so it, it gives a weight of whether it is more or less attractive to go in one direction uh, versus another one. That's why it, it, it's made by, so it considers both information of the pair, but then it also has information on destinations country potentials. So for example, the, the other, variable that has been largely used is uh, uh, something that takes into consideration the destinations. So when we compute the interaction between the destination and the time, it means that we include destinations information, not origin countries information. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. So, uh, Sorry, Christina, another kind of related. So in the equation that you write, most of the variables that are of interest are origin, and in particular, the weather is origin. And then the flow that you estimate is bilateral. Essentially, you're assuming that the temperature and whatever goes into the weather variable is going to affect uh, uh, in a way, affect 
out migration in a way that doesn't change the, the relative percentage migration to other countries, meaning you're going to simulate these things, but you're not going to assume that weather is going to affect differently in percentage term with where people go. Uh, it's just going to affect the total flows. So in this respect, you are a little bit, uh, your paper too is a little bit a effect uh, which is on the total out migration of a country rather than on the specifics of the bilateral migration. Okay, the idea is that the, why the climate matters because it represents uh, a, a push factor for the origin. Okay, so that's a, a push to the persons that decide to move or not. The direction that the flows take, uh, I thought, could be taken by the bilateral fixed effects uh, that we included. So some bilateral characteristics that, uh, you know, once a person decides to move because of the shock, whether it goes in one direction or the other is basically captured by the characteristic of that specific pair. It's fair enough, and I agree. But in another world, people could account for the temperature of the receiving country, and you don't move to very other hot, and there could be a difference in temperature that matters. So in that respect, you shouldn't sell your paper right out uh, as very different from the one who look at the effect of climate change on the total outflow. Look. That's the only point I was... Making. Okay, so le let me put it in a different way. Uh, fine that the identification comes uh, in the same way as a unilateral types of analysis. The advantage of having a bilateral context is that we can also respond to a questions on, okay, but at the end of the day, once you project in the future, where do we expect such flows to go? So if I phrase it in this way, uh, I hope I convince you. Because we also yeah, thought yeah, to yeah, add the you. destination countries information related to the weather, but we realized that they didn't really make any sense because it's, it's not as strong. So at the end, the people move because there is a shock in the country. And I don't think they get attracted by the, the climate in the destination. It does not make any role. So we had actually quite weird parameter estimate. Okay, sorry, I go on just quickly. Basically, we imagine that the agricultural productivity is the main channel that link climate shocks and emigration. And as I did with Giovanni in the paper and did other authors uh, later on, we decided to restrict uh, the origin countries to only OECD origin countries because these are the most developed ones where the agriculture represent only a small portion of the total economy. Uh, we actually, we exclude all OECD origin, but we kept Mexico and Chile because we thought they are important countries. I will show you that it doesn't really matter whether we include or exclude Mexico. So saying that, uh, the final sample is made by 100 origin countries and 166 destination countries from each decade, starting from 1960 up to 2010. Standard errors are clustered at the country per level, and we employ a pseudo maximum likelihood estimator. Okay, this is a very brief summary statistics of our data. We have some information which are bilateral, such as the immigration rates, which are expressed and multiplied by thousands because otherwise the parameters would be too small to see. We have average uh, temperature that ranges from zero up to 32 degrees, average precipitation of the decadal. We also have this draft measure, uh, which uh, gives information on the, the weighted number of months in which uh, the SPI at the cell level is below minus 1.5. Why minus 1.5? Because climatologists believe that a value of the SPI below such a threshold describes a situation of water scarcity. And finally, flood basically measures the, the, the quantity of rain in one day of the most rainy day of the year. Okay. 
And uh, this is just a description of our global aggregated flows of the sample that we consider. And you can see that these numbers increase from one decade to the other. So from 15 million in 1970, which is the decade 1960 to 1970. Uh, and then it goes up to 61 million in the decade between 2000 and 2010. Okay, these are the estimates. The first uh, is our benchmark uh, estimate, which is the one that we consider for the projections. As I said, it's estimated by PPML, includes per fixed effects, uh, country of origin fixed effects, and destination times decade of fixed effects. And you can see that uh, there is a positive and statistically significant coefficient of temperature which means that if we increase temperature by 1%, the emigration rate increases by 1.3%. Uh, as I said, this uh, specification considered the sample up to 2010, and we basically tested if anything happened if we stop in 2000 to keep only the stocks that which are built consistently by the World Bank. As you can see, the parameter estimate of temperature increases a little bit, but it remains in the ranges of the one before, and some other controls get statistically significant. We did a bunch of robustness checks. We removed precipitation. We only considered temperature and precipitation without drought and floods. As I said, we exclude also Mexico and Chile from the sample. We consider bilateral variables in place of the pair fixed effects. We excluded the terms, uh, the two terms for multilateral resistance. We also tried to test if there were non-linearities in temperature, meaning that countries that start uh, at, the height, uh, at the hotter uh, temperature might have a differential response with the others. Uh, we did uh, clustering at uh, origin country rather than uh, per country, or we also computed the flows as a difference between stocks. But as you can see, the, uh, the parameter estimate, which is basically graphically presented in this picture, it remains pretty stable. So it ranges from 1.3 to more or less 1.1, which is the lower bound. And the, the vertical bars are the confidence in there. Okay, so if I was clear up to now, what we do now is we keep the parameter estimate of our baseline specification and we manipulate what is the future climate. Okay, so we superimpose the climatic variables air as they will be in the future. Okay, this is a basically a representation of what would be the temperature in the future according to the two different RCPs. As you can see, and if I was clear before, uh, RCP 8.5 is the high emission scenarios, which corresponds to a, a much hotter world than the, the world under the RCP 4.5. So as you can see, there is a big variation in temperature uh, according to the RCP 8.5, which goes up to uh, in some cases also four and five degrees, uh, uh, increase uh, uh, degrees in 2060. And, uh, and another uh, uh, information that comes from this graph is that, as we know, the latitude at the pole will face uh, much warming than other parts of the world. But this is basically the type of temperature the variation that we impose in our projections. Okay, a little caveat. As I say, these are predictions that there is paribus. That means that the only thing that we change is the climatic variables. And that we clearly can overestimate the responsiveness if by 2060, which is the upper limit in our temporal window, if some adaptation occur in the country, for example, shifting the growing season or you know, adaptation mechanism. But there could also be an underestimation of the responses because 
what we exploit is an historical weather variation, which is kind of limited. While using such models, we try to limit, uh, for example, the time interval. We don't want to go up to the end of the century because uh, the climatic variation is too big compared to what we could uh, exploit uh, in our historical sample. But say that this is just uh, a very quick uh, uh, information on how much well, variation we had and how much variation we are imposing in our prediction. So as you can see on, on uh, the, the, the first bar, represent the average decadal temperature in our historical part, which ranges between 23 something up to, yes, around 23. Uh, while in our projections, we use means of temperature, which can go up to 24, 25, maximum 25.4 as an average in the decade. But there is anyway some variation in the sample. So for example, if you see in, in Iran, the minimum and the maximum average at the decadal level uh, changes by something like 1.3 degrees. Okay, so this is the first result, which basically compares what is the outflows of migrants that is predicted by our model in sample and out of sample, okay? And as you can see here, there is some increase in the flows of migrants. So let's say that the average of the flows of migrants in the sample was around 35 million, while our projections goes up to 130 million migrants in 2060. This is just a representation of the combination of the SSP3 and RCP 4.5. Okay, this is the same graph as before, but we compare all the different combinations of RCPs and SSPs that we decided to consider. And the SSP3 is the one that really projects the much larger number of outflows, but still also according to the other uh, SSPs and, and RCPs, uh, the projections of future migrants uh, are higher than what we actually observed in the historical uh, part. Now comes, I think, the most important slide of my presentation. Okay, Just so one... before, before you go, did you show the in-sample uh, projections for all the scenarios? What is the dynamics of the real data? Because if I remember well, in 2010, I mean, we had an increase in, uh, no, in the uh, flows. No, and I... here it is predicted that there will be a decrease between 2000 and 2010. So can you give yes. a, a sense? Okay, I, actually, the reason that is... I don't know, because I clearly noticed that our predicted flows, in sample predicted flows, is really matching the, the observed flows in 1970, but the matches gets worse and worse the more I move to the more recent time. A different story comes if I estimate my sample considering up to 2000. So if, for example, I use the other specification, the one that stops in 2000, I get a much better match between the observed and the predictions. So the idea when we write the paper is to use both specifications when we generate the projections. Because here I notice that there is, and I don't know why, I mean, while in 1970, 1980, it was a very good match, but then the match went worse and worse uh, uh, the, the more I move. But again, if I stop my estimations in 2000, then the, the match is, is, is also fine for the entire historical predictions, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Okay, so this is the most important uh, slide. Just one clarification. What did we do is to impose two changes in the previous projections. The climatic uh, change, okay, on the one hand, but also the population of the future. Because as I said, to move from rates to flows, one needs to multiply by the population. So what we did here is to try to decompose the climatic part from the 
social demographic part, namely the population change in the future. So the horizontal bars again are references for our historical predicted values. The big bar are the same numbers that I presented before. But if you notice, the, the lower bars, the light gray ones, is what happens if we keep the population as it is now, so the average population of the decadal of the, uh, of the sample, but we manipulate the climate, while the square that you see on top of the bars is the other way around. So we keep the climate as it is now, but uh, we basically use the population projections. So what we see here is that much variation, so the majority of the variations in the future projections is driven by the population changes. And again, I divided the graph in the four different blocks, depending on the RCP and SSPs. And as you see, there is, you know, this scenario with the, the largest flows is the SSP3, which is, if you see here, this is basically what is the projections of the population in the future according to the three scenarios. And as you see, the SSP3 is the one that imagine a world, the population growth is really higher. Okay, this is the same story as before. Now here we consider only the change in climate, but we keep the population as it is now. And we basically see what is the percentage change of the outflows for the specific countries of origin. And uh, if you see here, we see that there are many countries that basically will reduce uh, the emigration, while just few of them as uh, very, very high numbers, such as Mongolia, I think is Afghanistan, while the majority of the others, uh, we basically predict uh, uh, changes in flows which lie below the 20% compared to the uh, historical levels. This is a different story if we also add the manipulation in the population. So if we consider what you know, the SSPs predict in terms of future population, this is the percentage change in the flows that we can imagine in the future. Uh, clearly here, I had to specify one year, uh, one RCP, and I consider the SSP3. And this is the final slide where, as I said, we wanted to understand and give an answer on how many migrants would Europe face in the future. And as you can see, there is clearly a doubling of uh, the flows coming from Africa. So they can reach something like 8 million in 2030 uh, with RCP 4.5 and SSP3, a lot from Asia, but uh, clearly what you see here is that the majority of flows will remain within Asia and within Africa. One final, but this is simply the, I anticipated this so-called uniform scenario, which is a very naive story because what we do is basically we impose a one degree or two or three degrees increase in temperature in all countries of the world. And this is basically what we see. Clearly here, we don't have any population change. What changes is just uh, the warming. And uh, as you can see, clearly there are larger flows, but it's kind of limited. Okay, to conclude, according to our paper, we should not expect massive waves of climate-induced migrants because the demographic pressure is by far the most important driver of our projections. And that, that's the caveat that uh, we need to say that, of course, projections should be treated as a plausible range of outcomes rather than precise uh, forecasts. Okay, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much. It was a very good presentation for a first presentation. We have a lot, a lot of questions and uh, a lot of questions that were raised in the chat and uh, were not uh, fully answered. So we have questions for, from Jean-Francois, Lisa, uh, from Hélène, from uh, Clément, from Cathy. So I think that Jean-Francois was first in line. So Jean-Francois, 
you had a question on nonlinearity that was similar to the one of Lisa and maybe uh, another question of Frédéric. So maybe Jean-François, uh, can you ask a quick question on this, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Christina. It's very interesting. I I'm a bit uneasy uh, to raise a, a, a comment, but I'm not sure to have a suggestion. So I'm a bit uneasy about the, you know, the nonlinear response to climate. So you introduced this quadratic term, but in, in the climate science, there is a lot of nonlinearities, nonlinear non response, and in particular for migration, the issue is we don't know in which direction it may go, right? It may increase the incentive of people to move, but also uh, we may have more people trapped uh, in the place of origin. So I was wondering whether you cannot capture that maybe in more in a non-parametric way or something. I, I don't know, I don't know what to do. Uh, but then I, I just say the opportunity to ask another question about projection. I'm just wondering why you don't use more region specific projection for climate. From what I understood, you are using a uniform increase in temperature, uh, but I may, uh, it seems I missed that. Sorry. Okay, uh, okay, thanks a lot for your questions. I mean, I am the first one uh, since I started studying the topic that believe that uh, the response of migration to climate is not uniform. So, for example, the paper that I, uh, I have with Giovanni is one where we think that the response of uh, two countries is different from the response of middle income. And in particular, what we see from the paper is that there is an increase in emigration from middle income countries, but a decrease in migration from poor countries. And of course, that was on top of my mind when I started uh, this project. We really tried hard to introduce some, uh, you call it nonlinearity, I call it heterogeneous response. The problem is that the story becomes really, really complicated if you add also some uncertainty about the future in terms of GDP. Because, okay, this is the first problem, but because we don't really know how we can imagine. So if in sample, some countries are considered poor, then you need a lot of uh, assumptions to understand whether they will be and stay poor in the future or not, because that determines which parameter you use. And the second problem we had was that uh, in many specifications, in many attempts, uh, the projections exploded, meaning that the, the predicted values, even in sample, became unreasonable numbers. And then I think it depends on the fact that we used the pseudo Poisson maximum likelihood estimator, but we trade off the advantage of using such a specification, which I believe is the one that we have to consider when we have a bilateral framework, versus the, the advantage of adding uh, such a uh, complication related to the heterogeneous response. So at the end, we decided to try to keep things as simple as possible and get reasonable answer. No, no, the other question is- uh, Yeah, um, I think, uh, Lisa, is it, is it okay for you? Uh, your question was quite similar to, to the one of Jean-Francois, am I? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. So maybe a question from Hélène. And this question was also very similar to, the, to a question that was uh, uh, to, to be asked by uh, Cathy. So, Hélène, please. Thank you. Great presentation, Christina. I had a quick question on, I guess, the consistency between your results and the built-in assumptions on migration in the SSPs in particular. And the results, you show that you have most migration in the SSP3 whereas um, the SSPs are qualitative narratives, but in the population projections of the SSPs, you have uh, quantified international migration projections. And in, in the SSP framework, you have the least migration in the SSP3. And so I know that the whole framework is kind of built on a lot of different pieces and it's kind of difficult to reconcile everything. I was just wondering uh, whether you could comment on how you think about this. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Elena, for the question. The answer is that it's a very good question, and the answer is I don't know, but thanks for pointing this, because we will make a reflection once we, you know, we, we, we will write the paper. Because, no, I actually didn't think uh, uh, about why uh, there is a kind of divergence in what would be the migration 
predictions after the S SP3, uh, while we, we, we have, a, uh, so we have different trends, basically, the one that we find in this paper and the one that is basically produced uh, uh, according to the narratives. But then we will definitely think about it. Thanks for the question. Yeah, there was also... I don't know if my co-author could say something. Okay. Emanuele or... Uh, uh, maybe, very, maybe... Very quickly, because yeah, uh, quick, there are other quick, questions. Yeah. Super quick comment. Um, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about this because it, it is not really clear. The SSPs are really internally consistent. So I see a storyline that with very low income growth and high population growth in developing countries, so our results are driven by these. And I think in the SSP3, then they make an additional assumption of a policy that restricts uh, migration, which is something we cannot impose with our setup. But it's an interesting contradiction that's worth looking at. I, I'm not really concerned about this, uh, this problem. Okay, uh, maybe we can move to the next question of Clément. Clément, please. Very, very quickly, thanks a lot for, for the presentation. I was wondering about conflict and so whether that was part of uh, these SSP scenarios and whether that, that could also be part of, uh, of your analysis, because of course it, it does matter for, for this. Okay, at present, uh, we consider everything that can be absorbed by the fixed effect. Okay, so suppose that uh, the, the future will have a, a kind of a aggressivity of origin countries similar to the one that we observed in the past, then that's captured because we, we have the fixed effects. If something changes, not. But again, as I said, uh, what we have is a satirist particle. So that means that we only manipulate the two components that I mentioned. Everything remains as it stays but that's captured by the fixed effect. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was also a question of Giuseppe. Giuseppe, you had a question on the multilateral resistance terms, if I'm not mistaken. No, I, I, I've been puzzled. Hi, Christina. Uh, Hi. I've been puzzled like Michelle by your MD and A, because they are basically represented by non-time time invariant uh, uh, components mainly. I was wondering whether there is a, a high variation in those, and it's kind of puzzling. At the same time, they, they, I had the same impression as Michelle, how these uh, variables are constructed. Okay, I, I mean, now I step back because I, uh, okay, I, I, I read the literature on that. I thought that it could be a value added of having, of having the two terms, with respect to just having a destination times decade fixed effect. But I'm really happy to, to drop it. First, if we, you think that it's not the way to measure it, uh, given that I, I can control for it uh, in a standard way through the destination times decade of fixed effects. And as you could notice, there is not much changes in the estimates if I drop the two terms. So I'm really, you know, I'm, I don't have a strong a priori to keep it. I, I thought it could be a value added, but I'm, you know, I can simply drop it. I mean, uh, I know it's I, a very simplistic, simplistic uh, answer. <laughs> I, if, I, if I can uh, just add something, since you said that uh, 2010 is uh, uh, sort of I mean, changing your estimates, did you try to project stopping at 2000? Okay, the, so far projections, so the numbers we have is just based on that one that consider also 2010. But as I said, we will definitely uh, double our projections by considering only the estimates from the uh, sample that stops in 2000. But of course, we can simply keep uh, the historical estimates that goes up to 2010 and uh, no, okay, no, 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 sorry. It's only the other way around. So we don't, we don't imagine drastic changes if we do the projections based on the, the, the more limited uh, uh, sample, because as you see, the main driver is the, the, the temperature, but uh, the, the, the parameter estimate of temperature is, is very consistent with the uh, uh, current uh, baseline um, estimates. 
but yeah that that was definitely a, a an idea because uh we found quite weird that the, the predictive flows in sample were dropping in 2010. We really don't know what was the, the, the reason, actually. Okay, last question, maybe, or Simone, do we have still some time for one question uh, from Frédéric? Frédéric had a question. Oh, Frédéric. yes, Michel, thanks. Thank you, Christina, for the presentation. I was wondering whether it's not a strong limitation not to have education in your model. So you estimate a model in which you disregard to the rise in education in the past. Education increased just like temperature in the past, but more importantly, in the future, in the projections, we have scenarios about education and also in the same vein about urbanization. And we know that high skilled people are much more responsive to adverse shocks. So if education increases and if urbanization increases, this will affect the, the incentive for people to move. So isn't it something very important to take into account? Yeah, definitely. And it's uh, uh, okay. The, the, the reason why we didn't was because we uh, basically follow the approach in literature uh, that, of course, consider just in sample estimates, which wants to detect the net partial effect of climate. So this is one story. But of course, I agree with you that that makes our parameter estimate something which is not biased by over-controlling bias. But clearly, when you want to project in the future, you, you need to consider something that uh, changes with respect to the history. Given that we, we believe in the story of being as, uh, uh, as, as minimal as possible to get the net uh, effect, I don't know whether adding just uh, one dimension, which is, for example, education, would be something weird. So at that point, what we have to do, so the point is, we probably need to add many other variables in our framework. So I don't know, that's a, a probably a question that I ask you. Just adding education is probably weird. So at, at that point, we have to include many other controls, but then at the end of the day, what we get from climate is not, so it's basically what is left. So it, it, what we capture is just what is left on climate. Once we control all the other channels, which represents uh, mediating factors of climate. So I don't know if I was clear. So it's, I'm not sure that uh, we can move from the specification we have. Okay, thank you very much, Christina. I think it was a very exciting seminar and it was reflected by the amount of questions that you had. And uh, there are st I apologize for those who, who raised questions that were still uh, in the chat and not... Uh, we don't have the opportunity to ask a question uh, directly. So thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, okay, Simone, would you like to, to say something for the future? Yeah, <laughs> just seven <laughs> days ahead. So next week, we're gonna have uh, Patricia Cortes, one of the organizers presenting, and I hope to see you online. Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye.